It's such a pleasure to be back here. Uh, we've done a number of events here. We're always uh, very well received. Uh, Mary uh, Lynn is our, uh, our coordinator on site. Let's have a round of applause for Mary Lynn. We're delighted uh, that Peppercorns, another chamber member, was able to cater this morning, so please uh, part partake. Yeah. So last night you expanded your, your entertainment, right, with the Red Sox winning, designated hitter hitting a three-run homer, right? We have some Red Sox fans here, I can tell. There's a few tired folks in the uh, audience, right? Well, get used to it, because uh, this is going to continue on with these late games. Uh, but this morning we're going to expand your mind. We have uh, two... Brainiacs, in my opinion, uh, <laughs> Dr. Mike and Dr. Mike, and uh, we're excited to hear from them uh, on politics and the economy, and uh, we're delighted to have you, you here with us. So um, just to, I just wanted to touch on, on, on this campus. So a lot of people mentioned to me that they had never been out here. There's about uh, 20 acres of land here. This is the former Knapp Shoe. Uh, it was converted back in the 80s, and uh, we, we have our the, the Concord Foods new president who's going to tell us a lot more about it. But just in a, in a, in a kind of a nutshell, 200, over 220 employees, uh, so 20 acres, 220 employees, and over 200 products uh, made at this facility. Uh, extremely pleased to have them in our community and uh, as a member of the chamber. So we have a, a, a tremendous program. I'm just going to uh, call your attention to the green sheets that are in front of you on your tables. If you have a question, uh, for Dr. Mike or Dr. Mike, uh, write down the question and uh, one of the chamber staff will come around and collect it. And if we have time at the end, uh, we will uh, have a little Q&A. Now it's my uh, pleasure to introduce our MC for this morning's program, Fran Dillon from Stonehill College. Fran. Okay, I don't want to rub it in, but last night I was at the Red Sox game. <laughs> That's the good news. The bad news, I got home at two o'clock in the morning which is like eight hours past my bedtime. <laughs> so this morning I may appear to be a little dazed, confused, and disoriented. Now those of you who have been here before and heard me be the MC, that won't surprise you at all. You won't notice any difference. But for new people, <laughs> blame it on the Red Sox last night. Um, it's been my great pleasure to be a part of this chamber for over 40 years. Um, I was not at the first chamber breakfast, which was held a hundred and some odd years ago. Is that right, Chris? Yeah. But I've been a member of the chamber for, for many years. And um, I'm retiring from my current position at the end of December. I'll still be working at the college on a part-time basis. But when you think about retiring, you think about what goes along with it. And um, somebody asked me, when did I first think about retiring? Well, last spring, a good friend of mine who's been in the field of education for about as long as I have, called me and said, uh, can we meet at the end of the workday and go across the street to the 99 for a beer? And I said, sure. So he came to my office about noontime, the end of the workday. <laughs> and we went across the street to the 99. And we're sitting at the bar. And I say to Ken, my friend, I said, look at those two old geezers across the bar. That's going to be us in 15 years. He said, Fran, there's nobody across the bar. You're looking in a mirror. <laughs> So I had to give some thought to retiring at that time. Now, I work for a great company, and they're so generous. They recognized me about two weeks ago, and the president of the college got up to thank me for my years of service. And he said, Fran is someone who does not know the meaning of an impossible task, does not know the meaning of a lunch break, does not know the meaning of the word no. So we all chipped in and bought him a dictionary, so he'll know the meaning of all those words. But they treat me very well. But it's great to be here, and I will say that we do have a great program for you this morning, and um, I think we'll all get a lot out of it from our two brainiacs that be up here very soon. But first, I'd like to thank our chamber ambassadors who are in the room, Rico McNeil, Marnie Dutton, Richard Hook, Catherine Light, Brenda Karens, and Murray Vetstein. How about a round of applause for... There are a number of chamber board members in attendance this morning for the breakfast, including Kathy Smith, Dan Evans, Masa Kobaba, Ray Ledoux, and Pat Chiamella. Please a round of applause for our board members as well. And we have a number of elected officials. If I miss you, I apologize. I think we're expecting the mayor. He hasn't come yet, has he? 
Uh, but we also have City Council Ann Beauregard from Brockton and the Chair of the Board of Selectmen from the Town of Easton, Dottie Fulginetti. So you're all welcome here this morning. Today's Good Morning Metro South is being hosted by Concord Foods on this beautiful campus. Concord Foods is a leading supplier of retail food products and custom ingredients to nationally recognized supermarkets, food service operators, and leading food manufacturers. The company began in 1968 offering lemon and lime juices packed in fruit-shaped molded plastic bottles. Today joining us from Concord Foods is President and CEO Terence Dalton. Terence has worked in the food and beverage industry for more than 25 years. Early in his career, he worked for large consumer products groups such as PepsiCo, Snyder's Lance, Danone Group, and Sara Lee. Please welcome Terence Dalton. And interviewing Terence this morning is our own Masha Kobaba. So could you please tell us about yourself and your experience in the business? Yeah, so uh, I've been in the food business, like we said, over 25 years. Um, I've been at Concord Foods uh, for about two years. I've had the task to fill the shoes of Peter Neville, which is, uh, hasn't been an easy task. Uh, Peter is a great, great person, uh, pioneer in the, uh, in the food industry. Um, but the most exciting thing about being at Concord, number one, you know, you see our campus here, it's pretty special. Uh, and also the people are very special. Most of our people are from Brockton. Uh, a big Cape Verdean influence, um, and it's just in a really great community to build around and also grow our business with the people of Brockton. So, thank you. And so, tell us about the array of products that Concord Food offers and the employees and recent growth. You were telling us about the sure. great employees. We'd love to hear more about them. Yeah, so it, the good news is our business is thriving. Uh, we are we're growing at double digit growth. Uh, we have uh, three business units. I'd like to say we have our, our consumer products group, which you probably you're most familiar with, which you see our caramel tubs. Hopefully everyone goes out and buys some for the uh, apple picking season. Uh, we also offer our, you know, obviously our mainstay, which is our lemon lime juice that you, uh, you'll probably see. We have a big share of that nationally, about 80% about of the market share in the country. Uh, another area uh, that we do is industrial and food service, so we're a big supplier in the confection, also the dairy industry, uh, whether it be ice cream, yogurt. Um, so a lot of our products go into products such as Hood, uh, Stonyfield, uh, Denone, so on and so forth. Uh, and then also the confection industry, so we, we service the Hershey's of the world, um, also the Giardelli, the Lint's of the world as well, with some of our caramels and our variegates. And then our other business, which is our fastest growing business, is our food service business. So um, those of you who are coffee drinkers, it's probably our biggest segment. And we service the Starbucks, the Panera's, and the Dunkin's of the world. And if you get a caramel or a mocha in your coffee, that most likely is coming from Concord Foods. So we can anyone, can everyone hear me, by the way? This mic was a little off. Can you hear me in the back? No? <laughs> so let's try this. OK. Uh, we've hear, heard a lot in the news about the decline of Pepsi and other soda services and the increase in the food services, and, as you've alluded to. And with Concord Foods' big campus, is there room for expansion? Yeah, so uh, strategically there is room for ex uh, uh, expansion. Um, we've probably taken our, our employee group in the past five to ten years from 100 employees to almost with temp labor to about 290 employees. So. We have really overgrown some of the areas, so we're looking, how do we expand the campus here um, so that we can accommodate our growth as we move forward, so for sure. So, uh, you know, warehousing, you know, we, we self-warehouse for those of you, uh, for those individuals who are aware of the food industry, um, and we've kind of grown out of our warehousing space, so we actually have worked with Todd Copeland, who's uh, from uh, Chevrolet and also Toyota, and we lease one of Todd's buildings uh, right, off, right, right across the street. Um, and we use that as our warehousing space. So we're trying to stay within the community, okay? Um, it's easier to do the food business in, within the community. Uh, we also have space in Taunton as well, which, which we have about 60,000 square feet uh, in Taunton that we use. So we are easy, easily can get back and forth with our, uh, with our products and finished goods to service North America. So we do see growth expansions uh, both on campus and most likely off campus as well. Wonderful. We look forward to hearing some uh, exciting news and hopefully in the future. 
Uh, and so how about community engagement? What types of things does Concord Food do, do in that realm? Sure, so uh, it was interesting, you know, our host, uh, you know, our, our MC here from Stonehill, we just started for the first time uh, a Stonehill internship program. So uh, we have a young woman from Stonehill who's, who's working at Concord right now in our, in our viral marketing and also our online marketing. Uh, uh, so that's a program that we started. Um, we also are very active in the community. So like I said before, most of our employees are uh, from the Brockton area. So we give a tremendous amount back to the Brockton school system uh, because our employees have children within that school system. Um, we're a very, very big supporter of the, uh, the food bank, not only in Brockton, but also in Boston. Uh, we, were, um, we were very uh, much involved in the uh, Brockton uh, uh, 21st century, um, you know, uh, looking at Brockton and what, what Brockton will be in the years to come. We're very active in the uh, YMCA as well. Um, and another area for philanthropic is the Boys and Girls Club of Brockton. It is very important to us as we, as we give back to the community. Well, thank you very much, Terrence. Yep. Thank you all for coming this morning. Thanks for everyone coming. Thank you. It was really indeed a pleasure for me once again to introduce to this audience Dr. Michael Krasanik. He's a professor emeritus of political science and current special advisor to the president of Bridgewater State University. Dr. Krasanik is formerly the executive director of the Minick Center for International Engagement at Bridgewater State University. He is the author of eight books on U.S. foreign policy, American Government and Comparative Politics. His most recent book, written with his daughter, Ian Kareth, is the 25 issues that shape American politics. He is quoted regularly by local and regional newspapers on international uh, related in instances in international affairs and American politics. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the Metro South Chamber of Commerce, Dr. Michael Krasanik. Mike. Thank you, Michael. Um, I spent a lot of time in a classroom, so if you don't mind, I'll just put this aside here, if that's okay with everybody. I think you can probably hear me, if, if not, let me, let me know. I want to thank uh, Chris and the, um, and the members of the uh, Metro South Chamber of Commerce for inviting me here today and uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the issues. We're not going to talk about 25 issues. We've been here till uh, the Red Sox win the World Series. Um, and uh, by the way, this is not a book promotion tour, so I'm not interested in you going out to Amazon and purchasing the book. <laughs> Uh, so don't, uh, don't, don't feel any obligation along those lines. Uh, because of my background in, uh, in political science, uh, I've chosen two of the 25 issues that our daughter and I uh, have written about, and that is the, uh, the role of the middle class or, and the shrinking middle class in American politics, uh, and particularly in the polarization that uh, we are experiencing today in, uh, in American politics, and also talking about globalization uh, and its impact on the, uh, and the economy, both here in the United States and, and obviously uh, worldwide. So let me, uh, let me get going here and uh, put up a couple of, there you go. Um, they asked me whether I'm gonna roam around a bit. I'll roam around a little bit here, but. Uh, let, let me give you get the first the good news here, all right? And, and I think you probably are aware of the fact that uh, for the first time since 1999, uh, income uh, as determined by median household income, uh, 61,372. That's the first time since 1999 that that has reached that level. Uh, and obviously uh, an encouraging sign in our economy, and according to census data for 2017, there was an additional 3.2% increase in that 61,372. Uh, obviously, job growth, modest increase in wages are the sources uh, of, that, uh, of, the, of that increase. So I think you all know this, things are, are, are heating up, we're in, we're in a strong economy, uh, profits are generally up, I just hope no one has Caterpillar uh, stock, we'll get to that. A little bit, uh, a little bit later, but but generally, they, we are in a very, very positive 
economic uh, situation that has had an impact on that, uh, on that median household income and on any increases that will and but will likely continue, which will have an impact on the, uh, the middle class. Now, not such good news here. In 2016, those defined as the middle class, again, based on median household income, was slightly over 51%. In 1975, those defined as the middle class, again, using that, that data, was 61%. So we have had a significant shrinking of the middle class using that, that economic indicator there uh, in, uh, over the last 30 or, or, more, or more years. Uh, and that is a, obviously a, a, troublesome, uh, a troublesome figure. This is, this is what we get the, the so-called forgotten middle class, the shrinking middle class in our, uh, in our situation. And, and, and I'll talk a little bit about the, the impact of that in terms of people's attitudes and people's political views. Now, according to the uh, data from the Federal Reserve Bank and the Pew Trust, which does a lot of polling uh, in our country, 50% of Americans are having trouble finding the money to pay for emergency expenses in our, in our country. As little as $400 creates a financial crisis for these, for these Americans. Let me just add on to this. I've got a couple of things that are not on there because I just put them together here. And that is 47% of Americans could not cover emergency expenses in our society, right? whatever that might be. Uh, an accident with their car, some kind of minor uh, medical issue, uh, $400 is uh, not a lot of money for, for many people, but for, for this shrinking middle class, it's a lot. 55% did not have enough liquid savings to replace monthly lost income, 55%. And then 71% reported that they are concerned about having the money to cover everyday expenses. So we're, we're seeing here the, the not only the decline in the middle class, or at least now uh, maybe moving upwards a bit, but certainly the impact on what is often considered to be a solid group of people, the middle class. They're, they're, they're hurting. Now the Great Recession, which uh, all of you have certainly lived through as we did, stuff, snuffed out uh, any middle class incomes ma advances made up to that point, especially among minorities, and we'll get to that in a second. Although in that 2008-2009 period, those in the upper income bracket saw a modest increase in that period. Since then, they've skyrocketed in terms of uh, their, uh, their, their income. Let me give you, again, some other data that here. African Americans lost 50% of their wealth from 2008 to 2009. 50% of their wealth. Home ownership, whites 73%, African Americans 44%. Education. 34% of whites finished college, African Americans 21%. Life expectancy at birth in 2010, whites 78.9%, African Americans 75 years. Not percent, 78.9 years, not percent. Okay. So the, the, the point is, is that the, the recession hit everyone. There's no doubt about that. Everyone in this room uh, uh, probably didn't want to look at their 401k during that 2008-2009 period but it had an impact on the middle class and particularly on, on, uh, on those people at the very, very fringes and many times that were, those were African Americans, perhaps Hispanics as well. Currently there are 39.7 million Americans defined as living below the poverty level as defined by the Department of Labor and other governmental sources. Okay, that I, why I, here we go, here we go, okay. Now, this is what uh, I wanted to show you. When we talk primarily about the financial status of the middle class, using that figure that I gave you before, uh, there are five states that are in the best financial status at the present time. This has nothing to do with education, housing, roads, health care. It's just how many, these are the five states that meet that new level that is encouraging to many people. South Dakota, Iowa, Florida, Wyoming, and I have no idea why Mississippi is there, but this is out, this is out there uh, as well. Again, nothing to do with anything related to social economic or social uh, characteristics, but these are the, the five states that have the best so-called financial status of the middle class. Now, 
when we, when we look at some of the data here, what's, what's kind of interesting to me is to get some idea of what people are thinking uh, with respect to their predicament in the shrinking middle class. This is from uh, a NBC survey in 2016 that was published in Esquire magazine. Question one, about how often do you hear or read something in the news that makes you angry? Among white males, 73% that they get angry at least once a day. Once a day. The most angry were those in what was described as the middle of the middle class, earning between 50,000 and 75,000. Question two, do you think the American dream, if you work hard, you'll get ahead, is alive and well? Among the respondents, 52% stated that the vision of America once held true, but not anymore. Those respondents between 45 and 64, particularly white males, showed the least confidence in the American dream. Again, that white male, 45 to, uh, uh, 45 to 64, seems to be a, an ongoing uh, issue. Now, I, you don't have this on the, on the board here, but one of the things that I'd like to finish this part of the discussion is that the middle class has historically been the stabilizing force in American politics, the center. The center will hold the moderation of the middle class because they're doing reasonably well, they're happy with their circumstances, they, they believe in the American dream. Uh, that, that's disappearing now and creating enormous problems in terms of how they look at politics, how they look at politicians, how they look at Donald Trump, uh, how they look at their opportunities for the future. And again, that, that middle of the middle class, again, 50 to 75,000, white males, 45 to 64, again, points to the fact that this is where the anger is, this is where the collapse of the middle class occurs, this is where your shrinking of the middle class has had a uh, enormous impact on our political system, our political life, uh, and the polarization uh, that we are experiencing right now. The anger is there. The elites have forgotten these people, uh, have not done enough for them in terms of jobs and, and, and developing a, a, uh, a, a climate for them to uh, advance. And if you look at some of the people that are behind, uh, behind Trump at those rallies, generally white males, generally white females who are at home, generally taking care of the kids in many cases, have a budget that they can't meet because they're not making the kind of money that they need. They're not keeping pace with the, uh, with the economy and with the demands of the economy. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about globalization here. And before, before we get to this here, I, I just wanted to emphasize the fact that a uh, um, little bit of a background here, if I, if I may. When we talk about globalization, we really have to, it's not on here, but we have to get, go back to the Reagan era and the development of what was called the Washington Consensus. The idea of free trade, less regulation, uh, less emphasis on, on roadblocks to, uh, to trade. Uh, you follow that up with the, uh, China joining the World Trade Organization. You follow it up with NAFTA under Bush one and uh, Clinton. Uh, you then, of course, move forward to the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership signed or moved by Obama, which Trump negated. So you had this general uh, emphasis on the importance and value of globalization. Okay? And this has had an impact, as you can see here, on these are the top 10 international brands. It's not necessarily about how much they're making, what their profit, mo what their profit is, but I, I think you can kind of see what's happening here in terms of the impact of globalization on the U.S. corporate sector. Apple, Google, Microsoft, Coca-Cola, Facebook, Toyota, IBM, Disney, McDonald's. I think General Electric probably won't be there in, in future uh, Forbes magazine uh, presentation. Just Toyota is, uh, is the outlier here in terms of top 10 international brands. Again, not, again, we're not talking profit here. We're talking about brands. But just as an example of this, of the, of the impact of globalization, let's take a look at Walmart. Okay? Headquarters in Bentonville, reality a hugely international operation, the largest company in the world, and an example of how the global economy is organized. As of December 2016, Walmart had 6,345 stores in 26 nations, employing over 800,000 people. International sales, 32.7 billion, this is in 2016. Domestic sales, 129 billion, okay? 
Uh, Walmart largest business presence is in Latin America with nearly, nearly 4,100 stores in operation with its Mexico division consisting of 2,400 stores. So we're talking about a major impact uh, of, uh, on the global economy to a, to a store that uh, most of us shop at and, and is part of the American corporate, corporate scene. Probably Walmart may be down there somewhere in the future when we talk about national, uh, international brands rather than General Electric. So here's an example of one company that is clearly global in, in focus and, and one that has a tremendous presence around the world in Latin America in, uh, in particular. Okay, now this is a little bit of a narrative here, but the question has always been how many jobs have been lost to, through international trade? There is an article by Michael Hicks in the Financial Times uh, in 2016. I don't have the, uh, I should have the, uh, the, uh, the source there. Uh, it's often considered to be one of the more accurate assessments of job loss associated with globalization. Now, Hicks shows that about only 13% of the estimated 5.6 million job losses from manufacturing during 2000 to 2010 were caused by international trade. The rest came from rising productivity, automation in particular. So when you talk about trade and, and uh, the need for tariffs and, and retribution against uh, uh, countries, um, some of it is associated with the manufacturing and loss of manufacturing jobs. A lot of it is automation. We'll get to that a little bit later. The greatest job losses were in the furniture industry. Remember we mentioned about uh, uh, North Carolina, two, two places? Uh, Hicks found that 40% of the losses uh, were in the, of that, of that 5.6 uh, came from uh, the furniture industry largely in North Carolina and 45% in clothing. Quite obviously these are, uh, these are uh, clothing manufacturers that have gone south or, uh, or east. In both cases the job loss is a result of low wages in Asia that drove business <clears throat> to ship jobs overseas. Then my, one of my favorite quotes here, I, you may have read and, and are aware of Tom Friedman who writes for the New York Times, and he's one of the most prolific uh, and prescient writers on national economics. He also served as kind of a prophet on how globalization will affect the lives and futures of individuals, even those <clears throat> in his family. So this is what he, the advice he gave to his daughters. When I was growing up, my parents told me, finish your dinner, people in China, India are starving. I now tell my daughters, finish your homework, people in India and China are starving for your job. Okay. Now, just to conclude here, and because uh, uh, I want to give Mike an opportunity to, to present his, his, uh, his talk, the next challenge to, to uh, job security is not so much international trade, but artificial intelligence. Um, uh, if anybody has seen the commercials for the Google Assistant, you, they're, they're, they're on television all the time now. If you take the Google Assistant, which answers your questions, um, you know, how, who got the home run last night, that kind of thing. If you take that to like 10,000 additional uh, advances, uh, you're going to find out what, uh, what artificial intelligence is going to have an impact on the workplace and on work and on those individuals who are uh, who are going to be behind the eight ball, so to speak, with regard to <clears throat> artificial intelligence. I just finished a book by um, uh, Dan Brown called Origin. Uh, it's a novel, there's no doubt about it, and it's one of those page turners that probably is only partially true, but that's beside the point. He works with Winston, who is an artificial intelligence person, uh, but not really a person, it's a, it's a program. And Winston gives him all the information he needs, takes care of everything as he's trying to avoid all these crises as he moves around uh, Spain. But it's, it's important to recognize that that may be the future, the future of jobs, the future of robots, the future of the Google Assistant, the future of, of finding out uh, how to solve a problem or do taxes or, or develop an uh, a, a, a internal business uh, program. If anybody's ever has an opportunity to go to MIT's Media Lab, please go. MIT's Media Lab, in fact, you probably should have somebody from MIT's Media Lab come here. They're 25-year-old kids, kids, I can say that because I'm gray-haired, 25-year-old kids who are working on the cutting edge of artificial intelligence and will continue, continue to do that. But the, the point being here with respect to job loss and globalization is that uh, uh, tariff 
uh, regime of, 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 uh, of President Trump may not have that much of an impact on job loss. It's rising productivity, automation in, uh, in particular, which is causing the changes in our, so in our society uh, and in, in, the, uh, in the workplace and in the, uh, in the economy. And our young people and everyone better be, uh, better be uh, in, in shape for a challenging India and China and also uh, artificial intelligence uh, as, we, as we move forward. It is a brand new world, it is an exciting world in many respects, but it's going to change the workplace dramatically in the next uh, 10 to 15 to 20 years. So I'll leave it at that. So our next speaker is also Dr. Michael, Dr. Michael Goodman. And he has quite a resume, and I'll highlight it for you right now. He's the executive, he's a professor of public policy and the executive director of the Public Policy Center at UMass Dartmouth. Professor Goodman joined the faculty at UMass in 2009 after serving eight years as the director of economic and public policy research at UMass's Donahue Institute. And I think that's where we all got to know Michael in his previous life. A leading analyst of the Massachusetts economy, he has authored or co-authored over 50 professional publications on a wide range of public policy issues, including regional economic development and housing policy, as well as demographic and other applied social science research topics. He currently serves as co-editor of the Mass Benchmark, the Journal of Massachusetts Economy, published by UMass Donahue Institute in cooperation with the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Please welcome Dr. Michael Goodman. Now, I held the microphone, but of course it was off. I hope you heard that wonderful introduction. Do you want this? Uh, no, thanks. Okay. I can hit the back of the room, too. Thank you. Um, tough act to follow. I'm going to try to, uh, I think, complement uh, the great analysis you just heard with my assessment of what's going on in the state economy from the perspective of somebody who's paid very close attention to what goes on in Massachusetts and in our leading industries and in our various regions. It's always a pleasure to be here in the City of Champions. Uh, I think um, certainly I would agree with my colleague, the other Dr. Mike, uh, that, uh, that you know, the times are quite good despite what even depending on your political perspective is quite a volatile time. So we've got a lot of uncertainty on the policy environment side when it comes to our economic activity. On the one hand, we've got our monetary policymakers at the Fed raising interest rates, which I think is appropriate in light of current conditions. On the other hand, we have our federal government lowering taxes. There are really only two fundamental ways for governments to juice the economy at the national level. One is by making it easier to borrow money by pushing interest rates down. That would speed up the economy. You tap the brakes by raising the interest rates, so that's what we've been doing. Tax cuts, undeniably, are an attempt to put your foot on the gas. So do we have our feet down on both pedals at the same time here? Are we driving around with the emergency brake on? Yes, we are. Uh, and I think it's because the pace of growth, well, yeah, operator error, I think, would be my diagnosis. But, but the, um, <laughs> release the brake or take your foot off the gas. We have to make a choice. Uh, but we are in, a, uh, uh, in times that are quite good. Um, I want to underscore the comment that was made about inequality, but thinking about it regionally rather than uh, in terms of the different strata in our society or the different occupations. We certainly know about this here in Massachusetts where we're now in the ninth year of a pretty robust economic expansion, as you shall see, but that rising tide hasn't been lifting all boats. I think the real estate values in this area of the state still remain uh, below their pre-recession level. So uh, if, we, if we drive north of here, that's not the case. I recently uh, moved from Waltham, Massachusetts, to New Bedford, where, let's just say, my money goes quite a bit further, uh, and uh, my housing unit quality has gone up pretty dramatically, and a much shorter commute, I might add. Across the country, though, you can see, and this, I think, helps to explain why so many people are angry, um, that a lot of our economic activity has become increasingly concentrated in a relatively small number of areas. This divides all national economic activity in 2016, into the half of the regions that generated, into the regions that generated half, those are the orange, and then the blue is the other half, right? So think about how this growth has been driven. It's been driven by our innovation economy. That's certainly been a story here in Massachusetts. 
for high technology and life sciences and higher education and professional business services have really been driving growth. Private higher education primarily uh, on, the, on the education side. Um, and areas that are strong in those, um, in those spaces, including the greater Boston area, which drives the New England economy, have been thriving. Everybody else, not so much. And so that rising tide hasn't been lifting all boats, and that helps to explain, I think, some of the dissatisfaction in certain regions of the country. I suspect if you overlaid this map with a political map, it would help explain some of the, uh, the, the um, uncertainty and um, anger and uh, unexpected political outcomes that we've been experiencing in recent years. Um, I mentioned the federal tax cuts, and I think it's important to put them in context. They do have the effect of boosting growth. As you can see, uh, I think it's now 4.2% was the revised second quarter estimate. That's a very fast rate of growth annualized rate of growth for the United States. So you can see we've been growing for some time now with the blip in, uh, in early 2014 uh, since the end of the Great Recession. This is essentially what I would consider to be a, a, a bit of a sugar high. So I don't know about you, but I had to get up pretty early this morning and I was late, up late last night as well, not quite as late as you, sir, but, uh, but late. And so about three o'clock this afternoon when the caffeine wears off, I'm gonna have that middle-aged man's choice as to whether or not I'm going to go for the next cup. I don't think there are too many more taxes we can cut, and so there's real concern out there that if, the, uh, if we experience a reversal of fortune, that the tools that we have in our toolkit in order to deal with a recession are gonna be limited because it's tough to raise taxes in a recession, and uh, it's tough to cut taxes any more than we've already cut them and still remain solvent uh, as a nation. The theory behind the tax cuts was we've got all this money that's being booked as profit overseas to avoid our taxes, we'll lower the corporate tax, all that money will come pouring back into the economy, and then businesses will take that money and, and invest in productive activities that will lead to job creation and solve the problem that Dr. Mike uh, so nicely outlined. That's not really how it's been going. Normally, the, the relationship between the federal budget deficit, that is the annual shortfall um, in, um, in, in um, in revenues over spending, which is throughout our entire history, since World War II certainly, been negative most of the time, except for in the late 1990s. When the economy goes down, see that red line, uh, our, our, our deficit um, tends to increase. Um, you see it right after the Great Recession, that last gray bar, we had a giant spike in the budget deficit because we were spending money in order to try to resuscitate the economy, that six, seven hundred billion dollar in, uh, uh, investment uh, in the uh, stimulus was there. Normally though, as times get better, as they have been for almost a decade now, um, you see the uh, deficit get smaller, but not if you lower the taxes. So the jury has been back for some time now that lowering taxes does induce economic growth, but not enough economic growth to generate the revenue that you're losing from the tax cuts. I think there's only a few people left in the country that truly believe that in my profession. Unfortunately, most of them appear to be in charge. Uh, uh, of the decisions. Um, this question of whether or not in these tax savings, corporate tax savings, are going to find their way into productive use in the economy is another debate that's going on. Over the last several decades, we've seen a shift in the way in which businesses manage their, um, their capital. We haven't seen as much net new capital formation, so think now I have more money in my pocket, I'm going to invest in a new plant, I'm going to expand a facility like this, I'm going to buy new equipment. Less of that has been happening over time as the economy has changed to a more knowledge-based profile where heavy equipment and industry um, are not as big a contributor to the overall economy. Although I will say that the uh, death of manufacturing is vastly overstated. Uh, Dr. Mike was absolutely correct. We employ dramatically fewer people in manufacturing than we did a generation ago, but we produce more goods than we've ever produced before. So it's that productivity and that value added that's generated wealth. That wealth just hasn't translated into blue collar and middle class jobs because that's where the savings and the wealth have come from, from replacing human labor with automation and through competition, as was correctly pointed out. So. Um, the, uh, the latest data from the federal government suggests that we're not seeing the boost in investment that we expected, that a lot of the profit is being simply distributed through dividends to shareholders, which isn't a bad thing, but it certainly doesn't make the economy grow any faster, uh, and stock buybacks, that is the acquisition of the equity that um, 
firms issue in order to raise capital. So um, there's been a lot of profit taking. Again, I'm not against profits, but it doesn't make the economy grow faster than it does now. Here in Massachusetts, we are cooking on all cylinders. So in the second quarter, the U.S. economy grew at a 4.2% annual rate. Our best estimate, which we'll be revising down later this week, I'll make some news today, a little bit, from about 7.3 to about 5.9%, is a blazing rate of growth for a state uh, in our situation and with our demographics. So we're, we're, things are about as good as they get here in Massachusetts. And so if you're not happy with current conditions, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I know the rising tide hasn't been uh, lifting all boats, and that's certainly an issue. I travel around the state uh, describing stuff like this, and I do in many parts of Massachusetts you know, get the, the, the confused look when I say things are good and things are as good as they get, because not everybody's been experiencing it. Um, so uh, the third quarter wasn't as good as the second quarter. Again, Friday we'll be releasing our latest current economic index from Mass Benchmarks at the same time the U.S. third quarter performance is listed. I think we're expecting growth in the mid threes, which I think is respectable, but suggests that burst of growth uh, in, uh, in the second quarter uh, may not be sustainable. But going forward, I think it's hard not to see um, us at the top of, a, of the cycle. There is no law of economics that says we have to have a recession or a downturn. Uh, and so the fact that it's long-lived uh, doesn't in itself mean that it's going to end soon. But we do, over time, see imbalances building in the economy. And one of the main concerns, I think, here is sort of the flip side of the good news. This shows job creation in Massachusetts over the last several decades. So. I came out of college in 1990, you guys can do the math and figure out how old I am now, uh, uh, when we were in the midst of a very deep recession. Some of you, uh, some of the older folks in the room may remember Digital Equipment Corporation and Wang Corporation and the mini computer industry. I think now there are a lot of small businesses operating in those large digital equipment facilities across the state. We had a very deep recession associated with a huge housing downturn. Then we had a big boost in growth as the internet came online and we developed the, becoming the lead, one of the leaders in the new information technology and so-called internet economy, the wheels came off that bus around the turn of the century, right around 9-11 when that bubble burst and Wall Street decided it didn't want to invest in that anymore and uh, customers stopped buying equipment in the Merrimack Valley on the north side of, of Boston. Uh, they used to have 10,000 people making uh, 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 internet routers and associated equipment for corporations in, uh, in the Lowell and Lawrence area, now they don't. So that, those jobs went away. We had a very tepid expansion that never didn't even reach the prior peak, which means for the first, you look how, how long it takes for this line to get above the previous peak. It was about 14 years in Massachusetts before we had what I would consider to be net new job growth, that is jobs at created after we recovered the jobs that were lost during that downturn. We had a more shallow experience or less intense experience in the Great Recession because we weren't exposed to the things uh, as directly as some of our neighbors. We don't overbuild housing. In fact, we, we, we do a terrible job of producing enough housing, so there wasn't as much of a downturn. There certainly were foreclosure issues and household displacement, particularly in communities like Brockton and other gateway cities across the state. But for the most part, if you look at the state since then, since about the middle of 2009, it's been a straight line in the positive direction. So now we're at record levels of employment. Unemployment re remains below 4%. But we're running out of uh, um, labor. So we do have a lot of employers across Massachusetts and across the country, particularly in technical niche fields that are hard to fill and in low-income jobs that are difficult. Uh, and not well, uh, not well paid, like in human services, or in seasonal jobs in places uh, around the state like Cape Cod, the islands, and the Berkshires, where uh, um, attracting people to places where it's difficult to find a place to live to work for four months a year is turning out to be a difficult proposition. This shows the, the federal jobs uh, turnover survey, so-called JOLTS, which basically can allow you to calculate a ratio of how many people there are out there available to work and how many job postings there are. In June, it was negative, which means that we had more job vacancies than we had people who were available to work. And that's unprecedented. So this is about as tight as it gets. Um, so in Massachusetts, this has long been a challenge because, you know, we don't produce enough people the old-fashioned way. Uh, <laughs> uh, that is, we don't have as many births as we, well, we have more 
births than we have deaths, but not by enough to make a big difference. And so we rely on migration, and a lot of our population growth has been concentrated in areas of the state where our educational systems have not really met the challenge. And so we have the finest K-12 public school system in the United States and Massachusetts. I don't have to tell anybody here that the performance varies pretty dramatically from district to district. And where we're having the babies just happens to be uh, where we're doing the worst job in terms of educational outcomes. Even though the labor market is tight, there are still people out there who are looking for work, who are having a hard time finding an opportunity, even in this hot economy. This shows the broadest definition of unemployment in the United States. It's very similar uh, to the pattern we've seen in Massachusetts. That's the people who are unemployed, which I mentioned is now below 4% of the workforce. People who are part-time workers, involuntarily, that is, they would rather work full-time. Or people who are discouraged, that is, they say they've given up looking because they can't find anything suitable. We're just about 7 to 8% of the labor force there. So we've got around just under 4% completely unemployed, the, the balance uh, um, underemployed. So you'd think these folks could slot into some of these available jobs, but at this point, these folks are the very difficult to employ, and so tough to turn a, a, a displaced worker with uh, poor levels of educational attainment into a nurse or, or into a computer scientist uh, or, or uh, into a professor or, um, or into a skilled manufacturing worker, places where there has been job growth of late. So we do have a disconnect, I think, between the skills of the people who remain available to work of course, we've been able to historically uh, compensate for our low birth, way, uh, birth rate um, by importing people from uh, other parts of the country and other parts of the world. Demographics can get complicated, but the population changes in fundamental ways that I think are pretty intuitive. You're born, you die. Um, so my wife and I, we have one kid. Uh, there's two of us. There's one of him. Unless one of us defeats Father Time, that's minus one, right? So. When we're gone, we'll only leave the one of him behind. So we've compensated uh, for that by relying increasingly on international migration. So the perfect storm here for Massachusetts, particularly in certain fields and in seasonal industries, in human services, in healthcare, and in high technology and in the innovation economy has been, where are we going to get the people we need to fuel the growth that we're going to have? We're not going to be able to replace them all with robots. Uh, and so uh, in that context, regardless of your political perspective or your attitudes about culture and immigration, the current federal immigration policy is really hamstringing us here in Massachusetts and is extremely counterproductive. I mean, I have two colleagues at UMass Dartmouth uh, who are civil engineers, civil engineers. So if we're not careful, they might fix a road or, or, or repair a bridge. Um, they have the misfortune of being born in Iran. They're legal permanent residents. We needed lawyers to spring them from the airport last year. So this is unhelpful. Um, we rely on international students and international labor. And let's just say we haven't been the most welcoming place as of late. And so I think one vulnerability for Massachusetts and this region is if these policies continue, it's going to be very difficult for us to obtain the labor that we're going to need to sustain our expansion. And so in a strange, perhaps counterintuitive way, this policy is harming us uh, directly. Um, I think what's important to keep in mind, certainly from the point of view of the region here, uh, the, the Metro South region, southeastern Massachusetts, uh, around the periphery of the greater Boston region here, I think on the, on the, on the proper side of that line, our growth uh, in recent decades has been driven by innovation. So these are the big drivers, healthcare and social assistance. This is more than just hospitals, it's also research and development professional, scientific, and technical services, lawyers, accountants, consultants, engineers, designers. We're home to some of the greatest uh, uh, providers in the world in those areas, and they've benefited not just from the growth here, but from the growth around the world. And our professional and business services uh, employers are growing like gangbusters. I think they added about 5% to their total employment level. So. If you're skilled in those areas, it's a good time. Technology, information, finance, and insurance. Here, the higher and up, you want to be up on the right. That means jobs are growing, and we're specialized. We're heavily concentrated. This is, uh, so now if we look, the red now shows the employment base of the greater Boston region, and the gray, the employment base of the rest of Massachusetts. And it's really been a tale of two states for a couple of generations now. Again. 
the happy place is upper right. Where is that? So what do, we, what do we get in the rest of Massachusetts in the upper right? We get the hospital, right? We get the hospital. So the hospital employment and, and health care service delivery employment has been growing as we age. That's not surprising. But we haven't really figured out a way to get a toehold in the innovation economy outside of that 495 greater Boston region. That's continued to be an anchor on economic prospects for the region outside of the state. And increasingly, it's creating problems in greater Boston, because there's only so much concentration of growth you can have in a small place. Anybody who has to travel into that area of the state knows that it's getting kind of crowded uh, and getting kind of expensive. I had to leave. I came from New Bedford. I had to leave an hour before to get to Brockton because I wasn't sure whether the line to Boston will have extended back this far by now, and uh, it did. <laughs> Uh, real estate development activity is another stark indicator of some of this imbalanced growth and concentration in one region of the state. This shows the value, the added value to property tax bases in our cities. The blue bar is the city of Boston. The red bar is all the gateway cities, including Brockton. Um, and you can see over time the development, the added value each year, that blue bar used to be more or less balanced, sort of 60-40, coming uh, b before the recession. But we had a period of time where there was essentially next to no economic activity across our cities that weren't named Boston. Uh, and over time, if you follow this cumulative gap, how much real estate value has been added there as compared to everywhere else, that gap is now in the double-digit billions of dollars. So when you go into the state capitol and you see all of these towers, uh, and lots of building going on and lots of multifamily housing being developed. That's great. It creates construction jobs. It creates housing supply. We need that. If you need a $4,000 a month two-bedroom apartment, we've totally got you covered. Uh, <laughs> but it's very much been feast or famine uh, for Massachusetts. Um, think about all these problems in context. We don't have the right uh, necessarily enough workers. We don't have the right industrial base. We've got to sort of preciously guard the, uh, the farm-born workers that we're able to achieve, whether at the lower end of the skill spectrum where they're needed in great numbers, or the higher end of the skill spectrum where they're needed in great numbers. We're making it harder, too, by putting upward pressure on the cost of living. I mentioned the $4,000 a month two-bedroom apartment. I'm not kidding. Uh, housing affordability has been an issue, and there's a lot of things that are going on there, but part of the problem is we simply don't make enough housing. So, we used to make housing, remember, but black, uh, whether multifamily or single family. But for some reason, over the past couple of generations, we've stopped permitting it. And my theory, and I don't have to run for office so I can say this, is that our local governments resist housing often for very parochial and counterproductive and short-term reasons. That puts upward pressure on housing values, which is nice if you own a house, but it makes it increasingly difficult for our children for our municipal workers, for people just getting started around here to find a way to live uh, in Massachusetts. And unsurprisingly, we lose them to other states. So our trade balance in domestic migrants, that is the number of people coming into the state from out of state to stay as opposed to those leaving to go to other states has been negative uh, during this entire period. I think we're seeing a surge in cross-border commuting and maybe even some relocations in response to the hot job market. Some of these vacant jobs pay really, really well and make it possible for people to relocate here. But if we don't deal with this problem by completely revisiting some of the ways in which we regulate the use of our land, uh, I think we're asking for trouble. Um, we obviously have a number of different major infrastructure problems at the national level. I know you're fortunate enough to have a commuter rail here uh, in the area, unlike us, uh, down further south. Um, I know as a former, up until August, Boston area resident who relied on the MBTA, we've had some problems there. I know there are regional transit authorities that are sorely in need of investment. Um, but part of the problem is we've had issues managing the system. I'm all for better management and good government. But there are some things you just simply can't manage your way out of. This is a switch on the MBTA. I stole this from Secretary Stephanie Pollack, so credit where credit is due. <laughs> I don't know if you can see this, but it says, right, patented 1915. Now, I'm not an engineer, <laughs> but I would guess that we've made some progress in train switches since then. <laughs> and if I had a car, right, 
that was patented in 1915, and it didn't start this morning, and I wasn't able to come, I suspect your advice would be, dude, get a new car, right? So I think we need a new car. So uh, currently, the leadership um, just doesn't seem to be willing to do that for reasons that continue to baffle me. Um, I want to talk a little bit about trade, which um, I think baffles me no end. I'll defer to the political scientist on how we ended up in a time where Republicans are against free trade. Um, I don't know when that happened. It was about 18 months ago, it looks like. So I'm not, a, uh, I'm not gonna stand here in Brockton and say trade is an unequivocal good. I mean, we're in a region that was significantly disadvantaged by trade. But if you look at the big picture nationally, there's no question that the nation is better off trading than not trading. The net benefits, the winnings over the losings are snake. What we've done a terrible job of is helping compensate those that have been displaced. So it's not buying and selling things that's the problem. It's taking care of our sectors that have been disadvantaged, like furniture, like I, I hear you used to make shoes around here, right? So sh American shoes are awesome. Someday I aspire to afford a pair. Uh, and they're great, and they're high quality. But there are advantages, and uh, um, as a, a social welfare, not benefits, but uh, the economics term, to being able to buy less expensive shoes. More of us get to have shoes there. I would also add, we've not bought anything from China or Canada that we didn't want, right? They don't force us to buy anything. And what ends up happening when we put these tariffs on is that we're punishing ourselves. So I bought a new home, as I've mentioned a couple of times, and so I was particularly interested in uh, the price of uh, washer and dryer because I had neglected to negotiate the inclusion of said appliances <laughs> in the purchase and sale. That just happened to go up 18% annual, uh, annual rise. That's the consumer product index for laundry equipment. Why? Because the federal government has attached a, a, a fee to it. And guess who pays that fee? I'll give you two guesses. It's me, right? So I'm not happy about that. I'm not really sure how it makes me, us, more competitive or how it disadvantages them. Clearly, if you put a price on products that we import, it, may, it creates advantages for domestic producers, but it's hard to stand up an iron and steel industry overnight. I know I've been in conversations with a variety of different businesses, uh, and including the state uh, agency that overdoes uh, the overseas building, uh, school building construction. Hey, how much is it gonna cost to build schools in 10 years? I don't know, are we gonna artificially raise the price of rebar forever, or is that gonna change? I don't know how to predict that, there are some winners, good, you know, very modest gains in the aluminum industry. Someday, if we can retrain all the steel workers to do things that we've moved on from some time ago, we may have opportunities there. But the steel that's being imported and used um, right, raises costs. So the reason Harley Davidson is moving overseas is because if we make the parts more expensive if you make it here, and it's less expensive if you make it there, I don't know, you do the math. They're gonna make it there. So. Uh, suffice to say, trade wars are not easy to win. Um, now, I think I want to leave you, even though I think I'm, I'm optimistic and bullish on Massachusetts, if we can meet some of these challenges, housing, demographics and labor supply, transportation and other related infrastructure, but I do think we are coming to the end of a pretty good run. Um, the economics profession has a terrible record of predicting exactly when things are going to change, so full disclosure. But when you poll them, the Wall Street Journal polls economists uh, earlier in the year, the consensus seems to be just in time for the election. We may have find ourselves with a, with a reversal of, of, of fortune. I don't think this trade business helps a, at all. And so you can see right now, we've got a fairly low probability of a recession around the corner. I do think uh, an international crisis certainly could precipitate something, but we are running out of the capacity to continue to grow at our pace unless we can find a way to get the people that we need, uh, the infrastructure and the capacity that we need, uh, and, uh, and align our policies with our actual aspirations. It's remarkable that we've been able to, um, to, to do it as long as we have done it. I think the underlying strength of the national and the state economy is overwhelmed. I think some of the profound disadvantages that certain policy choices have left us with, um, but I do think um, history suggests this stuff can't last forever. Um, on that note, though, I do think Massachusetts is as well positioned to ride out whatever comes next as any other state. We're strong in the areas that we need to be strong. I think when push comes to shove, we'll do what needs to be done. 
uh, but there's no time like the present, and I think business leaders such as yourselves can raise their voices in the service of policies that's going to help continue this prosperity and extend it to more uh, communities and to more regions of the state than have experienced it so far. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.